I'm very, very happy this afternoon to introduce Ryan Bakley, <coughs> Director of Sales for ChargePoint. It's a national company, and we're delighted to have him. And Ryan will issue an overview of electric vehicles, their stations, and how they can fit into the scenario of multifamily buildings and complexes. Please join me in welcoming Ryan Bakley. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate you letting me uh, be part of your meeting today. Um, just wanted to check, is this blocking your view? No. Nope. You guys are good. All right, great. So today, um, as Jeff mentioned, I'm going to go over um, the EV charging market, obviously how it relates to, uh, to you guys on, on the multifamily side. But just to, um, since this is relatively new for a lot of folks, uh, I'll start kind of giving a kind of a market update as to where we stand locally here and kind of what's going on around the country because uh, there was a lot of activity going on. Uh, we'll give you a little bit of background on ChargePoint, but really get into how these applications are, you know, how, how they're starting to be applied um, to you know, apartments, condos, and then answer any other questions that you guys may have. Just to get a gauge though, is this, for most folks, is this relatively new? Does anybody have stations installed? You do? Okay, great. But new for, for the majority? So one of the reasons why this market is really starting to take off is all the different models that are, are starting to hit the market. I mean, this list continues to grow. Um, there's probably about you know, 10 or 15 more cars should probably be added onto this list. Um, what's becoming really exciting is that really the hottest car show now is CES, which is in Vegas, so it's a consumer electronics show. So you're starting to see these cars being launched there. It does better than anything else. I think, I think it was ranked number one or two this year. Um, so there's, there's a bunch of models being announced there. Um, that's where we have a presence and we, we make our announcements on our stations and all that kind of stuff. Because these, these cars are really kind of like iPads, you know, on wheels, which is, uh, which is really exciting. So to get into the different types of cars, you have your, your top section there. Um, those are called plug-in hybrids. Um, those, you're going to start seeing a lot of those pop up into your parking lots. And you may not even know it, they might already be there. What those are is um, it's an electric vehicle, but they get a, you know, maybe like 50 or 60 miles on a charge, and if they didn't recharge the vehicle, it would switch over to a hybrid motor. Um, and those are becoming really popular for those people that aren't 100% bought in on driving something that's 100% electric. It's kind of the best of both worlds. When you see BEV in the center, that's your pure battery electric. That means it's 100%, runs on a battery. Um, they have different ranges, different models have different ranges, um, but another exciting thing is that you're starting to see more and more cars hit the market that are getting over 200 miles, you know, on a charge. So it's getting very close to what a gas, you know, you know gas tank would be. Um, it's helping get people over that, over that concern. Um, and then your bottom section there is that there's a certain section of the market that can handle what's called the DC fast charger. That's just a, um, a significantly fat, you know, uh, like a ultra high speed uh, charger. Not all the cars on the market can take one. Um, but as new models are coming out, um, they're able to. Another thing I wanted to point out, um, and this list continues to grow as well, um, but all these uh, auto manufacturers on here have made an announcement within you know, a relatively short time. You know, all their cars are gonna you know, either have a plug or be a plug in or a hybrid, but they're really making that, um, that, that initiative. You know, Ford and Chevy you know, should probably be on this list as well. Um, and um, you know, even with even Daimler, I mean, they're they're actually an investor in ChargePoint. You know, we're we're a private we're a private company. Uh, we've raised about three hundred million dollars to date. Um, we just secured probably about eighty million from Daimler in our most recent round in our Series G. So um, BMW invested us, Toyota. So they're really trying to you know embrace this market as well. Um, quick snapshot on, on ChargePoint. Um, you know, we're, we're the largest provider of EV charging stations. We're about 74% of the market. We actually invented the smart charger um, back in 2007. The cars really hit the market around 2010. That's when the Nissan Leaf, um, there was a lot of buzz on that when that kind of hit, hit the market there. Um, and we're growing significantly. Um, when I, I started here a little over two years ago, and I think we had around 25,000 stations, and we're already at 44, and I think it's over 45 at this point. We're doing almost about 1,000 stations a month. And this is across the country. Um, in New York right now, we probably have around 2,000 stations. You know, locally here, we work with a lot of municipalities, a lot of multifamily, uh, commercial real estate firms, New York City and Con Ed. You know, are some major clients of ours. Um, you're starting to see a lot of fleets being converted over, so you're just seeing a lot of activity, and, and the governor in New York is, uh, is big on this. So there's a lot of incentives that have been rolled out through NYSERDA, 
familiar with NYSERDA, you might have worked with them on various grants, um, but a lot of funding flows through NYSERDA. We've probably put in 700 or so stations just through NYSERDA funding. And I do, more to come on it, but I, I do hear that there is going to be one where on the multifamily side uh, you'll be able to take advantage of it. Um, and it should be pretty nice. It just hasn't rolled out yet, but hopefully over the course of a year or so it, it might be out there. Just a snapshot of our footprint. So when you're talking about the types of infrastructure, um, you're either, you hear a lot of what's called level two charging. That's essentially what this is. And that's the majority of the market. That's usually what you see out there um, for public stations or, or at multifamily. Um, and we have a home version of this for, for your garage, you know, for a private home. Um, these put on about 25 miles of range in an hour. So the ranges of these batteries vary, um, but say, say you had a car that gets, you know, 100 miles, like a Nissan Leaf ballpark, it's around 100 miles. If it was totally dead to plug in, it takes about four hours to charge up. It's rare that you run it down that low, but, you know, typically people are charging for an hour or two. Um, and then you get over to the right, and that's your, your fast chargers. Those put on like 200 miles in an hour. And a lot of times people think, um, you know, oh, I want the fastest charger out there, but it really... For a multifamily type of environment, you don't need to charge up in 15 minutes. Those are really designed for certain fleet applications and along parkways and throughways. Um, although I have had some, um, you know, condos and apartments, they look at it more of just a marketing tool to say, "Hey, I have a fast charger." But from, and, you know, from just a true application standpoint, the level two charger, something like this, is really what's going to be appropriate because it's where they live. They're going to be there for an extended period of time. You know, they can charge up in an hour or two. Um, and what's neat about the technology is that there's notifications and things to help manage the utilization of the station because if it's at a, uh, say, apartment complex, you have one, it's shared amongst the, the residents, you have to have a way to, to manage that because it doesn't hurt the car or the station to leave it plugged in there all day. So, so what do you do? You, you can, um, so when the cars are fully charged, they get notifications letting them know that their car is fully charged. You can leverage pricing because you do have the ability to charge for charging. So you can have it either free or a certain price for whatever period of time you want. Um, then after, say, four hours, it, it increases. It's a great way to encourage people to get off the station. But things like that can really help you manage the utilization because you don't want one resident kind of hogging it all. Day. So um, from an application and a multifamily, there's really two options. You can have a station like this, which is that community or shared station, like I said. Um, or we actually have a platform which the station would be a little bit different, more like the, that CPF 25 there. But really that one's designed for if you have like a condo where people have their own designated parking spot. It's becoming a pretty popular, uh, you know, kind of hot amenity to have your own designated charger as well. So we have a solution for that. And it's very similar to almost like signing up for cable or renting a cable box. You know, they pay charge probably 20 bucks a month to have this service there. Um, and then that station would be theirs and it's designated for that. Um, and then as a, as a site host, you're able to add on to that $20 a month to recoup some revenue and stuff like that. So um, there's different ways to structure it. Um, I do find here um, locally, we do do some of the designated, but most commonly you see the, uh, the community or shared station, especially to start. Um, and not all site, uh, sites have uh, designated parking. And the station itself, it's all, I mean, these can be all customized. You know, these are, you can rewrap them. So, um, and like Avalon, another client of ours on the multifamily side, we work with a bunch, bunch of them, but you know, they rebrand like even the, the charge point cards. That's what activates a, a charging session. It's one of these. Um, and you can get a rebrand and you can rewrap the stations. Uh, one of these charge point cards, and I didn't touch on this earlier, but in addition to having the most charging infrastructure out there is that we also have the largest driver network. When you buy an electric vehicle in the glove compartment for most of the auto, auto manufacturers, one of these is in the glove compartment. You create an account, you download our mobile app, and you can see where all of our available public stations are. Um, the reason why I point that out is that if you have residents that have an electric vehicle, there's a good chance they already know who charge point is. I think it's 80% of EV drivers are, uh, have an account with us. Um, and in New York, we're growing around 54% are just our driver subscription. Um, I mean, it's the number of four state, four, it bounces back and forth, but the four or five state in the, in the country with the amount of EVs that, that you have. Um, and there's a current rebate right now um, for the purchase of an EV up to like $2,000. Um, that's through my survey as well. So you get more money if it's a pure electric, like well, a little less if it's a plug-in hybrid. But that's really helping to drive the market as well. And uh, this station right here, on the right, that was the one I was pointing out that 
that you can put in and have it kind of designated for uh, for a particular resident um, if you wanted to go that route, if you thought that made sense. Yeah, as a station owner, um, because all of our stations are, are smart stations, there's a, there's a software component. So that's where you, through the software is how you manage the station. So setting things like access controls so you can have it set so that nobody outside of your residence can even activate it. Because not everybody has a parking garage or you know gated or anything like that. So if it's an open parking lot, you, you don't have to worry about people that just live nearby and know that you have a station there and try and use it. So you can set access controls so that only your residents are able to use the station. The pricing, report thing on things like energy consumption, utilization data, if there's some sustainability or green initiative, you can report on all that stuff. There's a slew of reporting that you can do. Uh, we could also generate a lot of that information on your behalf. So depending on what you're looking to do with that data, we can uh, make sure you, you have access to it. Um, but the key thing is that's how you manage everything, all your pricing policies, all that stuff. How much does it cost to charge a car? Um, good question. So it depends on the model of the car. Um, on the low side, which is the majority of the market, they only pull about three kWh in an hour of charging. So, you know, if you're paying, you know, if you're closer to the city, you might be paying around twenty cents, you know, per kWh. So, you know, it costs you sixty cents to charge for an hour. Um, your, your most expensive car is going to be your Tesla, which pulls about seven kWh, so dollar forty. So it's rather rather low, um, and most and we have access to a lot of data because we have the most stations out there. We've done millions of transactions and most cars really across all applications whether these are at a workplace or multifamily or whatever it is most cars are usually plugged in for about four hours and they're only actually charging for one or two that's pretty consistent you know varies sometimes but if you look at the data that's pretty common so that's why having policies around you know I don't want you on that thing for more than three or four hours is, is pretty you know a good way to manage it you know but again it varies by location and who's using it and how many EV drivers you have. But that's what we'll work with you on, on figuring all that stuff out. Um, from the driver side, um, as I mentioned, all this, you know, they, they use our mobile app. I mean, if it's at, at a multifamily, they know the station's there, obviously, but you know, they, they really interact with the station through their phone. So they get notifications when their car is fully charged. Um, there's a cool feature called waitlist, where say, say all the ports, this one can charge two vehicles at the same time, but say two cars are on it charging and I'm a third driver, and basically tell the station that you know text me when it becomes available and it'll hold it for you it also lets people know that people are waiting for that station so there's some neat features built in um, and that's the value of it being a smart station as we had these upgrades we just push them out to the station and let you know that they're available we don't charge for upgrades we just it's all about driver experience user experience and, and owners so we got to make sure that you guys the station owners are happy but we also have to make sure that all the EV drivers are out there you end up on some nasty blog EV blog somewhere <laughs> so so we you know they're all clients of ours all right, that's I, I, I can send this out to, to Jeff and he can kick it around to the to the team um, one thing I wanted to point out um, that's actually a recent install in, in New York here um, you know, putting protective bollards in front of it if it's outside is typically a good idea um, although they are put in between two spots but you know, just to protect the investment. But things to consider is just to keep your install cost down is proximity to the power source. Sometimes where you think the ideal spot may be, maybe so far of a, a run where it kind of kills the uh, kills the project because the install costs are too expensive. So you want to make sure they're as close to the utility room as possible. <coughs> also, um, because these are smart stations and there's that that software piece, how they interact with the cloud is all via cell signal. Um, which is which is great because uh, so they work with Verizon, Sprint, AT and T. It's the most secure way of managing all the data, but you do have to have a, a good cell signal. So if it's in a parking garage type of uh, environment, um, that's something that would be part of scoping out the install. Is what's the cell signal like? If it's weak, then we would need a, a, a cell booster, which isn't a big deal. We have these things underground, but that's just something to consider. You don't want that uh, a surprise cost at the at the end. Um, Can you skip the cell signal if you use uh, Wi-Fi, like wireless? No, it's all, it's all got to be cell. Yep. So there has to be a cell signal. Um, if you install two of these next to each other, one of them has the, the gateway or the modem in it, the other one connects to this one via Wi-Fi, but how it actually interacts with the cloud is all always through cell. Is that a security issue? It, yeah, that's why we designed it that way, it's mainly for data security, for managing credit card transactions and all that. Also to support a wide range of clients. I mean, we, we just actually put one in at the White House. A lot of federal sites, and governments, and stuff. And that's what they want. And, uh, <laughs> and 
And then, um, and IT departments typically, like you said, they don't, we don't have to tap into the local network, deal with you know, Cat5 wiring and all that stuff. So it's usually, it's been popular. Uh, do you outright purchase this or do you rent the station? Typically they're purchased. Uh, most people do buy them and own them and take, you know, we have some, some new, I wouldn't say leasing, but it's kind of conceptually kind of like a lease where it's a packaged up and you pay it annually as opposed to buying it all up front. And the other question is what kind of liability do you have on the downside? Is any of these stations ever you know, had a significant accident, explosion, fire, you know, that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, knock on wood, uh, none of ours have. Um, all of our stuff is UL certified. Um, and there's surge protection and all that kind of stuff. I haven't heard or seen, know of any, any um, things that have happened. Um, said UL is actually a customer of ours as well, so they have us. But so everything's UL certified. There are stations on the market that aren't, believe it or not, that they kind of hit the street before while they're in like the process and stuff. Like that, how, how they do it, I don't know, but um, that's something you, you know. Whether it's us or somebody else, you want to make sure. Obviously, it's UL certified, but all of our stuff is. Um, it's got, you know, I forget how many thousands of amps of uh, you know, surge protection and stuff, and. These things aren't live when you go and plug it into the car. It doesn't just put power in right away. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but this is actually, this is just a demo station, but it, it operates just like a regular station would. So that, you'll hear it click. So these stay locked, part of that access control. And you'll see a couple, there's like five, uh, five plugs, but the, these two are actually communication lines. So when you plug it into the car, before any electricity is dispensed, the station talks to the battery. Um, the battery tells the station, this is how much power I can take, and then the station's like, okay, you know, and then it does it. So they, they kind of communicate before anything gets dispensed out, which is pretty neat. Who, who does the install of the charging station? Do you have a group contractor or with the owner? Yeah, there's flexibility there. Um, we don't do our own, so we either have a, a network of electricians that we work with anywhere in the country, um, or we work with um, the site host or you guys, for example, um, you know, on using your own. Or sometimes it's a hybrid where you might have electricians that you've worked with a bunch of times. They give you great pricing or, or even somebody in-house that you can leverage, have them run the power, and then we come in and just pop on the station and commission it and stuff. So we're flexible. And in terms of infrastructure requirements, is that something that you you would provide to the contractor or yeah. the standard? Yep, product? yep. So yeah, we have we have installation guides, certification course, data data sheets. We have a full engineering team. You know, we'll work with them to make sure um, they know what they're doing. Brian, I would just su uh, suggest, not knowing how much more you have to go with this, let Brian. I would su suggest let Brian finish his presentation, then we'll have a healthy round. Otherwise, if we do it this way, he'll never get finished. Okay. Yeah. I, I kind of kept it short, so I'm almost done. It. Really, what's left is just a, a handful of installs that, that I recently worked on. So this is actually the city of Schenectady. Um, it's not a multifamily application, but just to kind of give you an idea of what one looks like, this one they actually put on, on the curbside, which is pretty neat. And luckily it was charging two vehicles. That's actually a BMW scooter. That's what kind of scooter? BMW. That's just hit the US market. I don't even know if it's out yet. They just happened to be there for an event and they were charging it up. It goes like zero to 60 in like two seconds. <laughs> but they still call it a scooter. It's not a motorcycle. <laughs> Um, here's another. Um, so if you have an outside parking lot, this is going to be a very common looking uh, installation. You know, put right in between two, uh, two spots. And a lot of times you do see like the parking lot lettered or even painted green, green stripes and stuff. Um, this is inside a parking garage. So there's one with um, a DC fast charger. I don't know if you can see from back there, but down the line there's a bunch of these, uh, these level twos as well. This must be California. So see how many there are there. <laughs> so, um, and what else? Solar. We were talking about solar. So this is actually right outside uh, um, City Hall. So New York City is a client of ours. They, they use us for all their fleet stations, and they're actually putting in. This was their first one. They piloted for like a year, but they just bought like another 35. We don't. We don't get involved in the, the solar piece. We're just providing the, the charging station for it. But you're starting to see these types of applications with integration with solar carports and things of that nature. And depending on how you're structuring the, the solar piece, you know, with through power purchase agreements and stuff, you can wrap in the funding of the, the station through some pretty creative finance options, leveraging solar. And this is just a, another example. Yeah, so I just wanted to show you some. But yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. Actually, the only other thing I'll, I'll touch on is just from a power requirement standpoint, a level two charger, they run on either 208 or 240 volt power, which is you know, standard power at any of your buildings. Where it starts to get kind of crazy is when you're talking about the DC fast chargers, because those are all high voltage, 480, three phase. But for, for majority of what you guys would be looking at, 208 or 240, each one of these ports 
whether it's our stations or, or somebody else's, they require a 40 amp circuit. Um, so if it's a retrofit type of application, that says something to see is how many of those circuits do you have available. So, but yeah, happy to answer any questions you guys have. You you get you send out once you get the station, you send out monthly reports showing how much energy is being used and who's using it. So you have uh, you have access to the, the software piece. So there, there ha somebody will have to be a network administrator. So at any point you can pull up that information. I'm I'm happy to do it on your behalf if you have a you know hey can you just pull this up for me you know we we can do that. Can uh, okay. Yeah, but but you have access to that yourself as well. So usually there's a there's at least one network administrator, username, password, and they can go in there. And it's a simple, it's one of the standard reports. You click a button and it, it'll show it. And you can look at it. this Excel spreadsheet? Or yeah, everything, everything can be ex exported. Be exported Excel. Excel or text. That yep. You're uploading to other software. Exactly. We do a lot of integrations, especially how complex this market's getting and integrations with building management systems, these fleet applications. So through APIs and stuff like that, we can oh, do a lot of okay. integrations. I'm just curious, uh, because I, I don't know, that's why I'm asking the question. Now, the billing charge is, for let's say, a, a, a call for condo complex, does it go into, uh, maybe my colleagues here at property manager can tell me, uh, how is the billing, uh, how is the electricity paid for? Is it assumed in the common charge, or is it uh, yep, so by the, user, or how is that? Yes, yeah, so this is this is tied to the, to the service, so it's almost like having a piece of equipment plugged in, so it's gonna hit your utility bill. But there is metering within this. So in New York, they do, New York does allow you to charge per KWH. So we'll manage the transaction and collecting it from the uh, from the tenant or resident. Um, but when they're plugging into the car, so if you're paying 10 cents per KWH is what your utility rate is, you know, you can mark that up slightly, you know, charge them 15 cents per KWH. So as they're plugging in and strong power, we're, we're Managing that and collecting the appropriate fees, and then we deposit it into your account. This doesn't, uh, I guess, part two of your question about electricity. Uh, this doesn't make any kind of a dent on the capacity of the grid, does it? The national grid, or the state grid, or the local grid, or whatever. Um, in certain scenarios, I mean, one at a at one you know one station at one facility, if both even if both are plugged in, it's not that big. I mean, each side is like seven kW, you know, at max power. You know, a lot of cars can't even pull all seven kW at once. Um, but say worst case scenario, you're at, you know, so that's 14 kW. Mm -hmm. Your building is kind of on the low side. But then when you look at somebody like New York City Fleet, where they have 700 of our stations, and a lot of times all their charging happens at night, and you, you look at their energy curves and stuff like that, um, which is why ConEd actually has a program where they incentivize fleets for charging during midnight and 8 a.m. So we have a scheduling feature. So they can plug in anytime they want, and we won't start the charge until midnight, and then they can actually get paid for that reason. But the utilities are looking at all this stuff because as more and more people, and a lot of people are charging at home at night, you start to see an impact. So they're looking at all that stuff now. Do you have the ability to have the credit card charge right at the station? Um, not with our stations. Um, so when you create a charge point account, part of that is uploading a credit card. Kind of like Easy Pass, we take like a $10 hold on it. And we only, you know, that's not money for us, but that's just so we can collect funds on the site host's behalf. Um, if you know how to steal identity, a credit card swipe is a very easy way to, to do it. So from a data security, we don't do it that way. Yeah, and for the resident, we, you know, we can help roll it out to residents and, you know, the, the residents, yeah, um, help them create an account, get them a charge point card, um, but they would have to upload a credit card. It's not at the station. Oh, sorry. I'd be curious to see what your sales are down south or out west where the weather is a little bit more prevalent, especially those charge stations outside. Is that a factor in no, hey, you, by, how, how you, durable are those? You want to repeat the question for those who may not have heard it. Just yes, please. Yep, yeah, so how durable, how, how durable are, are the ones that are charge point stations that are outside in, say, a commercial parking lot? Or, yes, so. I mean, does weather really play a factor in something of that size? Okay, so the question's about uh, the durability of these, like out in the elements and the weather and stuff. Um, they're actually very durable. Uh, this is our, our stations are all anodized aluminum. There are some stations out there that are painted steel. They'll be rusty in a year. But ours are all anodized aluminum, so they don't rust. Um, the temperature ranges are, are extreme. And we have these way up in, in Canada in cold, you know, negative temperatures and then we have them out in warm. And um, we have them also along the coast, especially out in California. In Texas, uh, I was going to say, a place like Texas where there's massive flooding. Yeah. Would it, would it be ruined? No, no. Um, a lot of the, I mean, this is a demo tabletop, but picture this pretty much extended down to the ground. Yeah. The electrical components don't really start up until here. 
So I mean, even during Hurricane Sandy, with the volume that we have in the city, we have you know, at that time maybe like 500 stations around the city. I don't think we lost a single one because we have to be raised pretty high. I mean, with this whole thing under water, you know, it is <laughs> there's going to be issues. But it kept rot I think it's two feet is where the where would start to be an issue. Can they be mounted on the wall? Rather yep. Than, you know, yes, we have we have wall mounted. We have wall mounted. Uh, this is actually that's a commercial. That's Microsoft, but those those are actually mounted on the wall. And did you have a question? I'm sorry. Uh, a, a follow on to this one. Um, so then, what are you experiencing as your average life expectancy for units? Uh, we say ten years. Um, this is our third generation, though. So even our original ones that were installed in 2007, those are still operating today. Okay. Um, but but we also, say ten years. Can you speak to um, the availability of my sorta and any other things and incentives for, yep. for co-ops co and apartments? Yeah, so right now, um, we, were, we were recently awarded two grants through NYSERDA. The first one, a lot of times they're specific as to who, who can take advantage of them. So the, one of them was specific to municipalities. So we put in like 100 ports in northern New York. Um, the one that we were just currently, that we're about to deploy is all for workplace applications. So more for employers doing it for their employees. Right now, there's nothing available on the multifamily side. Um, but we do hear, because we're, we're talking to them pretty regularly, um, that something will be coming out. Just don't know the timing. But uh, I, think, I think they will be putting something out. Um, a lot of their other current grants right now are for like these larger demonstration projects and stuff like that. Um, but nothing specific for multifamily right now. Except for tax, there's a tax credit. So if there's a tax credit, you know, actually, but that was only through 2017. We're waiting to see if that gets extended. What does something like that cost? So the unit itself for a dual port, um, for just the hardware, is around seven thousand dollars for the hardware. Um, so that could, if you like to look at it at a per plug, it's you know thirty five hundred dollars per charging plug. Um, you know that's without any kind of discounting or, or you know that's, that's kind of list pricing. Yeah, seven thousand two hundred ten dollars is the MSRP for for this freestanding. Wall mounts are a little less expensive. Um, I usually like to say what the installed cost would be, factoring in the average installation. You're typically looking at ten to fifteen thousand dollars installed, so that's factoring in the hardware, software, or the installation. Um, sometimes it could be less than that, but that's a pretty. You know, that using fifteen is a pretty good average because um, I have seen it higher than that. Um, but that's part of our job is to help scope it out so it's the least expensive from an install standpoint. Are you aware if? Uh Addition to these stations, to whatever buildings have any effect on the premiums that they're paying for insurance on the actual building? Um, I haven't heard that ever become like an issue. Um, the liability, I mean, as a station owner, it's it's yours, well, but I, mean, I haven't heard that come up as a, as any uh, concern from any of the customers that we're working with. So I would ask, you know, your specific insurance company if, if what the factor is, but the volume that we're installing, I've yet to have that ever become stop somebody from doing it. The question comes up from the liability standpoint, um, but I don't think so. What's the maintenance on that? So um, they're rather low uh, maintenance. Um, we do have a maintenance package, not required. Um, uh, you know, biggest wear and tear on these things are the, the cord itself. So that's a better shot. So you can kind of see the cords are actually 18 feet long. <coughs> demo so it doesn't have it, but that piece that goes up the back where the cords kind of looped on, that's a, actually like a cord retractor. So the cords stay off the ground. Um, some stations you'll see out there, you have to manually wrap them up. People don't, and then they're kind of left on the ground. That's where you start to run into issues because they're left in either, if it's outside, they're salt, they get run over, plows, they just become kind of a mess of your you know, cords and stuff. Um, but because it's anodized aluminum and everything we use is, is real rugged, it, it's usually rather low. Um, but what we what we do um, is for the first year uh, we besides just a parts warranty it's parts and labor but we guarantee 98 percent uptime of the station we're monitoring it 24 hours a day you know full parts and labor as I mentioned will come out within one business day um, and if you like that type of maintenance you don't have to worry about it we have you know packages you, know, you could buy multiple years it's, it, depending on how many years you, you buy it's usually like 650 to 750 dollars per station. I just wanted to comment on the insurance question. I don't think a building's insurance carrier would have an issue with these in terms of increasing liability premium. I think they'd be fine with it, but I do think that 
Um, the building would be wise to notify the carrier of the intent to install because there are some potential liability claims that would come up you know, with, with use of or misuse of that. Yeah, or trip it over the cords and stuff the like that. Yeah. Say, well, we weren't aware of this exposure. We're not going to cover the claim. Also, if you buy one of these, you should make sure to add property insurance to cover the unit. If somebody drives into it and destroys it, you want the insurance to pay for that, and it's not part of the building, so it would be personal property of the condo or apartment. Right. Yeah, thank you. Who does the installation? Electrician? Mason person? Typically an electrician, whether we provide one or you have one that you uh, find on your own and or work with. Do the wires run underground? Um, for the for the freestanding station, typically, yeah, this, the power comes in underneath. Um, we have had some times where the power has come from the ceiling and it was drilled in the side. Um, when it's a wall mount condo, it runs along the wall and kind of goes in on the side. But if it's one out in a parking lot, say, it power comes underneath. So that's where site selection is really important because if you're trenching a long way through pavement, it gets expensive. If you, if you have a larger service, say you have a 100 amp service that you're able to provide, Will make the charging time of the vehicle less? So, you know, typically each one of these ports requires a 40 amp circuit. Um, because these are smart stations and there's a soft, you know, the software component, through software we can actually scale it down and make it fit to your service rather than paying for a service upgrade. Um, if you have to make adjustments on that though, it would sl charge slower. Um, might not be a big deal at a, at a multifamily because they're there anyway, so a slightly slower charge might not be a big deal if it saved a lot on install costs. But yeah, we can we can we can make things work. So for a dual unit, you need a hundred amp service. You need two forty amp grand circuits. You need two forty amp. Right. I mean, we can run these off of one forty amp, and we, we would share the power if two cars were plugged in. Um, but there's some neat energy management. Charging at a lower rate. Exactly. Until the one car was fully charged, and then the other the other one would get the full right. power again. So the, the stations kind of manage that. There's a lot of ways we can figure. Are, is your company the seller exclusively, or do you work through resellers? Um, both. So yeah, so we, we work direct, and we have a whole network of um, channel partners and resellers, distribution. You know, so. But I, I work for ChargePoint. So. From what she said about if you get your own electrician, or do you do it? If you get your own electrician, don't you use your warranty still guaranteed the same? Yep. So what we do is we still, even if you did you uh, use your own electrician, we do what's called a site validation. So we're still going to send a team out to validate all the work, make sure it was installed to spec, make sure the station is working appropriately. So we will send somebody out. Um, so that, that's part of it because with our because we have that 98% uptime guarantee, and we have financial penalties that we don't meet that. So we want to make sure it's it's good to go. If we didn't do a site validation, then it would just be a standard parts warranty. But you know we typically come out on site. The only ongoing fee, um, unless you want a, uh, a maintenance package, which isn't required, the only ongoing fee is the software piece, um, and it's it's paid up front with the station and they're just renewed, you know, annually. Um, you can buy up to five years up front, but you just have to we're just required to buy one year of it. Um, it's two hundred and eighty dollars per year, not per month, uh, per charging port. So that's that's the only ongoing fee. So if you bought one year of it. You know, in 11 months, we'll reach out to you to renew. Um, you don't have to renew. The station will still work, but you're not going to get all the, the features that you would probably want, like the, the ability to charge for charging, get the data out of the station and all that. So that's the only ongoing fee. And typically, um, especially in a um, multifamily setting where you know you're going to have utilization because you have EV drivers there, and when you're figuring out what you want to charge for charging, you kind of factor that cost in. So you know, many clients cover that. Five, you know, so for a dual port to be five sixty a year, you know, are able to recoup that in what they're charging for the service. Some have separate memberships, like oh, it's fifteen bucks a month to be part of our chart. You know, there's a lot of ways you can structure it to recoup your your money back. Do you have any market demographic assistance to help a customer in this room understand the volume of uh, vehicles in there? Um, yeah. So in in New York right now, we have around. It's growing pretty regularly, around 20,000 or so. Um, but our, just the from a charge point driver, it's growing around 54% year over year. Um, and there's certain pockets. Westchester County in the city is certainly a pocket. Then you have Long Island. 
um, has a, a big <coughs> concentration of them, and then uh, Rochester and Albany, but Westchester County itself <coughs> and New York City are, are probably the, the two hottest segments of in New York right now. I, I don't mean how hot is your product, I mean how hot is the demand for your product in an area Oh, for, I'm thinking drivers into the subscription growth. Oh, for the um, for the station. I mean, I, I only cover New York and New Jersey, and I'm just probably putting it. I mean, and I'm not talking about what our competitors are doing, but you know, I'm selling probably about ten of these a week. You know, 10, 10 dual ports a week. And most of it has been in New York. Um, not all. That's not all multifamily, but you know, we're working with you know, you know, several of the large firms. And they're all getting used because there's a lot of demand. Yep. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So the utilization's high because a lot of times they, they first put them in when they start getting asked by their by their tenants or they're getting calls from people that are looking for places to live and they're they're starting to get asked. So and then that's when they, they put one in. Um, it's really a marketing tool because especially with like the apartments.com and some of these other search engines are, are all talking they're going to start adding like a filter for EV charging. So you, you know if you're not on that filter or don't have one, you might not be found. They haven't done it yet, but that's something we're we're in talks with you know with them. You don't, you don't sell your product direct to, we get calls, or you know, a couple of calls probably a month, I want to get a thing of buying an electric car, that can install one in my parking spot, can I do it? And uh, the general answer for most co-op boards is no, and if you can, how will we get a monitor to the electric to use? You don't, you don't sell them directly to the general public to install, do you? Um, there, there was a few in um, in Jersey City where the resident really wanted one. They talked to their their, their HOA and, and they're like, yeah, we'll let you do it, but you're paying for it. And the residents have paid. I mean, sometimes I've had the resident just pay for the equipment. Sometimes they pay, they wanted it so bad they paid for the install and the station themselves. Um, they just got the approval from the HOA, and they probably had their own agreement as for what happens if I leave, <laughs> you know. But but sometimes that happens if the resident wants it bad enough. They they I have seen them pay for it out of their own pocket. I got, I got a question, I guess, for Dan. Since you're here. How would you handle that kind of situation? Somebody says, I want to put an electric charging station in my... You obviously don't want to take it when they leave. Right, I mean, I would treat it as a fixture, right. one, but also it just depends. It's going to vary to each building. It depends on what's called. He says, the bylaws, the plan, the nature of the Parking situations, you can go down for the sign spaces and the non-sign spaces. Remember that how to meter for the electricity um, variety of factors as well. It's going to be different for every building. Or it's going to be important. I think though, like a picture of the system, probably you have to get a ironclad. Their co-op condo insurance cover them in an instance like that. Well, that's why I think, as I said yeah. before, that you have to put the carrier on notice that uh, um, you know if you're going to be installing one of these things, whether it be a private con condo or co-op or so by unit owner. Um, so I'm a little concerned. Like a unit owner says, I'm putting in my like spot 24, which I rent from the co-op condo. And it's not attached to their apartment in any way. So with their liability, if you is there a way they can cover it through their insurance? I mean again, this is all yeah. this happens from time to time, it's similar to like cyber liability insurance, which was new with the advent of all of these cyber crimes that weren't around ten years ago. Um, I don't have a lot of I don't have a dozen scenarios of claim examples that I can lean on to respond to. I'm not aware of anything. I doubt that anyone in this room has it. Definitely. Uh, so I think it needs to be addressed, um, you know, with all due care and conservatively with respect to the insurance carrier, rather than finding out afterwards having not raised the issue of the insurance carrier that something's not covered. Anyone else? Uh, are you aware of any 
pending code language that would require retroactive installation of charging stations? Not retroactive. In New York City right now, there's a, a current code that was passed a, a few years back where any new parking garage or parking structure, 20% of it okay. has to be EV ready. That's any, all any, the any new. Any new, new but as far as a retrofit, yeah. I haven't heard of anything. I'm not saying there's might be some yeah, that works, sure. but I, I haven't heard of that. It's really all, all new construction. approval from the city um, for installing these? I mean, it, it requires a standard you know, electrical permit, so there would be a permitting, permitting, you know, but I, I haven't run into um, any permitting issues. You know, it's, it's rare. In terms of a residential home, do you see this becoming a little more affordable? I mean, $7,200 is yep, so our, pretty steep. A residential home, yeah, no, I, I get it, yeah. So for a residential home station that we have, it is around like five or six hundred dollars. But this could be used in a residential setting, correct? For for a multifamily complex, because it's share around. I'm talking, I'm talking like a private home. You say know? I had a home in Scarsdale, and I just bought an electric car. I needed one of these. Yeah, so you would put, we have a, we have one that's designed for the home. And it's uh, less and than 72 Yeah, it's right. around $600, <laughs> $500, something like that. Um, it doesn't have to be as rugged or commercialized because it's right. your home and you're going to treat it better. It doesn't have to have come core management. It's not all aluminum, you know, it's, 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 it's rated for outside, but it's a much smaller footprint to hang on your, on your wall. Um, but yeah, so it starts around $500. Yeah. Yeah. But same, same charge of speed. Same charge of speed. Right. Any other questions? Carlos, did you have one? Okay. Yeah, one more quick one. What's the out of your rapid fire log on so the RI question is a little tricky because it is more of an amenity. Um, you can based on, because the factor you don't really know is how, how often is it going to get used. If you have residents that are already there with, with um, electric vehicles, you can estimate utilization and based on how much you're charging them, you can come up with a, with a number. Um, you know, I've, I've modeled some out where, you know, maybe like six years or so, um, based because we had some, we could predict the utilization, but, you know. Public stations are really tough because you just don't really know, so it's just kind of a shot. In the <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's really, you know, in my opinion, viewed more as, as an amenity. Again, you want an ROI on it, but some of it's hard to quantify that that, that station helped bring residents. Because we've, we've talked to others and we've, people have left because they couldn't charge their Tesla there or something like that, you know, so it does happen. So it's more of a marketing tool, you know, and an amenity. Jason? Just one last question. Do you provide labor to install it, or is that, how is that handled? Is that through your, your company? Or? Well, we have partner electricians we work with, so we have a network. We don't, they're not charge point employees, it's just a network of certified installers that we have. So if you had somebody that wanted an installation here and you didn't have your own electrician, we would, we could give you a couple recommendations. Yep. When you say certified, they do just some kind of training on your specific? Yep. Equipment. Yep, absolutely. And many of them are, are O and M partners too. So if there was a service issue or related, they, they would also be the people we dispatch out to to do a repair or diagnose something. You said this is like your third model. Any last question? Our, our third generation. Third generation. Yeah. What do the other ones do that this one is better? Um, a lot of it is like the digital screen. So that's like a high def screen. You can actually upload your own videos. But the cord management piece. So before that. We'd have to manually spool it, just kind of a tighter design. A lot of it's also on the inside. Like it's very few points of failure inside. There's probably only like three or four connections where the other stuff had maybe more wires. So just from a serviceability standpoint and stuff. But that's really it. Um, and also just a one last thing that I just when we're talking about price, that designated station as opposed to this public shared station, they start around fifteen hundred dollars. So if if that would make sense for your application, I mean there are different price points, and that's where you know, if anybody was curious about this stuff, I'm happy to hop on a call and kind of talk about what the specific application is and tell you what you know, general cost would be. But prices do vary. Right. Please join me in thanking Ryan Bainty of If any of you have any ideas for future membership meetings of the Advisory Council of Managing Agents, please feel free send them to the BRI offices, keep your eyes open for our next emails about our future meetings in the next few weeks, and thank you all very much for attending this afternoon. Have a great day.